Welcome. In this series, we'll introduce you to basic mixing terms and techniques to set you on the right track for your future music production. We'll show you how we went from this to this. Check the video info for an index if you want to skip parts. This time, equalizers, when, where and how to use them. Equalizing, or EQ for short, is the process of increasing or decreasing the loudness of specific frequencies. After basic levels, which we covered in the first video, EQ is one of the most important effects in music production. You can think of an EQ like a mixer for each frequency in the sound. It gives you control over the levels across the frequency range, allowing you to turn up or down the bass through to the highs. More technically, EQ allows manipulation via a set of peaking, shelving and pass filters. If those terms sound confusing, we explain their function and parametric EQ in our Parametric EQ2 video. Before we start, we'd like to make a distinction that has implications for how you use EQ. This video considers equalizers as a mixing tool to get the mix sounding even and good, not sound design where you're using an EQ plugin to heavily shape a sound to create something new. For these two tasks, we recommend using two separate EQs, stacked. One for the sound design and another for the mixing process. Otherwise, it becomes very difficult to separate the two tasks in a single EQ instance. Do one thing at a time. Equalization, as the name suggests, is used to make sounds fit in context with other sounds, either by achieving the same frequency response as other sounds, aka EQ matching, or by sculpting the frequency ranges of sounds to fill the natural gaps in other sounds to complement them. For example, a kick drum and a hi-hat don't share much of the frequency spectrum, so they can play at the same time and be equally heard. But some sounds clash, and you can use EQ to make space so otherwise competing sounds can coexist. Let's equalize some tracks in context so we can develop a feel for the workflow. <laughs> The first thing I'm noticing here is that the claps, hi-hats and tambourines are too bright for the minus 4.5 decibel slope I have in mind. See the levels video for more info on this golden value. So, I'll open a parametric EQ2 on all of them to fix that. Let's solo the tracks by right-clicking the first one's solo LED, then left-clicking the others. Select band 7 to be a low-pass filter on all of them, and bring in the cutoff frequency to where I think it'll work. While we have these EQs open, let's also dial in a high pass filter for these signals. Even though these sounds are clearly focused on the high frequencies, there is often some lower frequency information in hi-hat and clap sounds that does not need to be there in the context of a mix. The kick and bass sounds already dominate the lower frequency range, and this is just unnecessary sound energy. It's good practice to only allow the frequencies in a sound that absolutely need to be audible. Because even if those frequencies aren't intrusive when soloed, in the context of a mix they can interfere with other sounds. Engineers often refer to this as muddying the mix. To preserve the most headroom for other elements in the mix, it's recommended to find the best frequency location to high pass every individual element in the mix not intended as a low frequency sound. Let's move on to some more full range tonal sounds, like the synth clavinet. I'll make a tonal and a bass bus track too, so we can group what we're listening to. Notice when soloed, the low end of the clavinet interferes with the highest frequencies of the bass. Some of the picking noise of the bass is getting in the way of the rhythm of the song. So I'll go into the EQs on the bass and clavinet track and high and low pass them. That's odd. The bass and clavinet are still fighting each other. This is a phenomenon we call masking. 
when two or more sounds are prominent in the same or a similar frequency range, our brain can blend them together as a single sound, making it hard to clearly distinguish them. One sound masks the other. This is where you have to make a decision about the hierarchy of your mix. Which is the most important sound in that frequency range? In my case, I think that it's the bass. So I'll use a peaking filter in the clavinet's EQ and drop it by about 6 decibels at 300 Hz to give more space in that frequency area to the bass. Much better. Looking at the drums now, it's a good idea to feature them where they are most prominent, especially in a context like this, where they provide the main backbone for the song. They should be the signals that are always clearly audible. Instinctively, you might use peaking filters and boost where the signals already have the most power. But oh no! What is this? That made the signals louder. When you are additively EQing sounds, increasing the level of frequencies by boosting, the resulting overall level of the entire mix also increases. To compensate, you need to attenuate the output of the EQ when you do this. An alternative, and in this example quicker way of achieving the same result, instead of boosting the frequencies you want to feature, simply attenuate the frequencies you don't want to feature. What I needed 4 bands to do with additive EQ, I can do with 2 bands using subtractive EQ. Now I just need to make up the gain I've lost, and there we are. Finally, EQing, like many audio effects, is hard to get right first try. That's why Parametric EQ2 has a compare switch. Click the up down arrow control to swap between the saved bank and the main bank. It also gives you a fresh perspective on what you have done compared to where you started. Tweaking any parameter in the spare bank will cause it to become the main bank again. Use this to compare EQ settings and decide if you like a change. Okay. Now I've worked through every track and applied these concepts. Let's compare what we had before with what we ended up with. As you can see, equalization can greatly improve the emphasis of certain sounds in the mix and increase overall clarity by a lot. And that's it for this video. We hope you enjoyed our introduction to equalization and that this video will give you the tools to EQ faster and more efficiently in FL Studio. As always, remember to check the video info for segments, any relevant manual or video links, and the example projects used in this video.